And the King James text today reads, Mark 13, 3 through 13. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed, lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be. But the end shall not be yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogue ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Now the brother shall betray the brother to death and the father, the son, and children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same <coughs> shall be saved. Boy, you can probably already tell this ain't going to be a shouting message. <laughs> Subject matter is kind of heavy duty. I believe today this is a prophetic word. And that is how I offer it. If you'll bow your heads with me a moment. Great King Jesus, how we love you, Lord. Master, it is our greatest joy and privilege to be able to come into this place which today and now is the house of God. It is the house of God because the people of God are here and you've promised, Lord, where two or three shall come together, where two or more gather together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And Lord, today this is your sacred place. We welcome your presence. We welcome your anointing. We welcome today, O oh God, the power of God. We ask, Lord, that you would anoint both the speaker as well as the hearer. Help me, Lord, to deliver that prophetic word that you have placed in my spirit for this hour. Help the hearer, Lord, to not merely hear it, to receive it in their hearing, but, Lord, to receive it and understand it in their spirit, that they might be able, Lord, to go from this place challenged, changed, equipped, and ready to stand against the wiles of the devil the tricks of the enemy, the deceits of the deceiver of men's souls. We ask it all today in that precious name, Jesus. Amen. Praise amen. God and amen. I kind of have a long title on this today. I try not to use long titles, but I couldn't quite think of anything shorter. The much-anticipated rise of anti theism. The much anticipated rise of anti-theism. When the disciples of the Lord came to him inquiring about the signs of the times, things that would occur prior to his returning, 
He gave them a laundry list. He said, well, nation will rise up against nation. said, there'll be earthquakes in diverse places. He talked about wars and rumors of wars, and he spoke of all these things. He said, but this is just the beginning. And then he goes on, and the closer you get to the return of the Lord, you find that the attention turns to the church. All of a sudden, he says, they're going to begin to deliver you all up before councils and before kings for my name's sake. Uh-oh. Are you talking about persecution, Lord? Yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. There will be persecution that is going to rise up in the last days. It's going to come. What cracks me up is we've got foolish people in America, in the American church especially, they can control government and they can manipulate secular law so that they don't have to experience any persecution, bless God. Because we're too pansy to deal with persecution. We're too snowflake. Yeah, the people who call us snowflakes, they're too snowflake to handle any kind of persecution. God forbid. No, they want to write laws, Johnny, that prevent anybody in the church. I bless God, if, if they try to force me to do business for with a queer, I sure don't want to bake a cake for a queer. <laughs> Honey, I got news for you. You bake cakes every day for adulterers. You bake cakes every day for divorcees. <laughs> you bake cakes every day for strippers and prostitutes. You don't even know half the cakes you're baking and why you're baking them. Choosing who you want to discriminate against is not a scriptural pattern. That is not a scriptural decree. The Word of God nowhere says that standing for holiness means that you deny others the ability to do as they please and to do as they feel and to do as they wish and to do as they believe. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that. My Bible said that you're to obey the laws of the land. Do you know what that means? That means you get a free pass. If there's a law that says you've got to bake cakes for somebody that you don't like and you don't agree with and you don't approve of, God says bake the cake because that's what the law tells you to do. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Bake the cake. You get a free pass. God is not going to hold you responsible. You're not going to stand before the Lord in judgment. And he's going to say, well, you're going to hell now, baby, because you baked the cake for those queers. <laughs> yeah. But we've got churches and preachers and Christians in America who call it standing for righteousness. <laughs> of course, these same people don't have the stamina to stand when it comes to doing the right thing and living the right thing for themselves and in their own lives. No, when it's convenient, they'll lie. When it's convenient, they'll do somebody dirty. When it's convenient, they'll cheat. When it's convenient, they'll steal. When it's convenient, they'll shortchange. When it's convenient, they'll do all kind of ungodly things. But bless God, they won't make a cake for queers. <laughs> You're supposed to Stand for holiness and righteousness in your own life. You're supposed to have the strength and stamina to do what is right for yourself, for your own life, so that when you stand before God in the judgment, you have not... It's not an issue of participating in someone else's doing what you perceive is wrong. It's an issue of answering for those things which you did yourself because Amen. those are the things you're going to be responsible for. The Word of God yeah. said every man shall answer to God for the deeds done in the flesh. Yeah. You're going to answer for you, baby. It's another passage in Revelation chapter 17 today that I want to share with you. Uh, one verse, verse seven, uh, 14 in chapter 17 of Revelation. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So in Mark, 
chapter 13, verse 13, we're told that when the tribulation, when the trials and the persecution comes against the believers, that it's those who will be faithful to the end who will be saved. That's what the Lord said. And then in Revelation chapter 17, we read that there are people who are going to make war with the Lamb. You see, they're not going to fight against you and I. They're going to fight against God. Do you hear me now? They're not going to fight. We're not the object of their battle. God is the object of their battle. There are many people in the world today who identify as atheists. If you notice with the rise of social media, uh, I think most of us today are probably exposed to the voicings of more atheists than we've probably ever been exposed to in our whole life. Everywhere you look, there's groups on Facebook, there's groups online, there are people advertising on television like Ronald Reagan's son, Ron Reagan Jr., who brags about the fact that he is unapologetically an atheist. And he belongs to an organization that believes in keeping religion out of government. Well, Ron, I got news for you. I am everything but atheist, and I agree with you on that point. I believe religion is supposed to be out of government. Right. I believe the two are supposed to be separate and unique and individual. So I could walk with you hand in hand on that issue, but you tie into your atheism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I got news for you, baby. I ain't going to walk with that mess. But there are many people in the world today who identify as atheists, and the Spirit of the Lord has shown me, not everyone, but he has shown me that many, many, many of these people, Martin, they're not atheists at all. Yeah. They're not atheists at all. They're anti-theists. Mm -hmm. They're not against, they don't, they don't not believe in God. No, somewhere inside them they have a concept of God. They, they have some knowledge of God, but they're mad at him. They're upset with him. They're not happy with him. And most of the time, it is because of the actions and the words and the behaviors of the church. That's right, yes. My goodness have mercy. It's because of the way that Christian people have conducted themselves. Because of things that Christian people have said and done, that these people have turned on God. And they think by looking up toward heaven and saying, I don't believe in you anymore, that they're hurting God. Honey, you ain't even a pinprick in God's favor. <laughs> Never mind a spear in his side. Hello now. You, you're not hurting God in the least. The word of God said, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Mm -hmm. You're not hurting God's feelings by trying to deny him. My question to you that claim today to be atheist, are you really atheist or are you anti-theist? <laughs> are you really not a believer in God or are you secretly a believer but you're mad at him? You're upset with him. You're not pleased with the way his church has conducted itself and for that reason you have turned on him. You see, this movement of anti-theism, not atheism, anti-theism is something that is much anticipated by those of us who understand biblical prophecy. Listen, in Revelation 17, the Lord said, These shall make war with the Lamb. Well, honey, if somebody's going to be fighting God, somebody got to be mad at him. Mm -hmm. Somebody's got to be upset with him. You see, Satan has been working in the world to try to generate a rise in anti-theism. Satan has been working in the world to try to create a mentality of hatred toward God. Because in the end, Martin, when he puts together armies to rise up against the Lord Jesus Christ in the battle of Armageddon, he's going to need people that don't like God very much. Mm -hmm. Hello now. Am I telling the truth? He's going to need people who are quite upset with God. i got news for you. That army is on the rise today. I've got news for you, folks. 
Those people even now are being recruited. And here's the sad part. In America anyway, this is what God showed me many, many, many years ago. I've been preaching this now for more years than I can remember. In America anyway, it's because of the church. See, we read our Bibles and we read things. We read that there will be persecution coming against the church. We read those words, Lisa, and then we make all kinds of assumptions. It always cracks me up. I'm, you know, when, especially where prophecy is concerned. I've often said that prophecy is best understood after the fact. Mm -hmm. You can read all kinds of biblical prophecy and you will never get it until after the fact. When Jesus came, they were able to look back at the Old Testament writings of the prophets. They were able to look back at the law. They were able to look back at the Psalms and they could see Jesus all through those books when they didn't see Jesus before. Those things didn't make them look for the Lord, but those things help them identify the Lord once he arrived. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? That's why when you read your Bible, especially in the Gospels, it'll say that, for instance, uh, Mary conceived of the Holy Ghost, and they say, for the Scriptures say, behold, a virgin shall conceive that bring forth the Son. Do you follow what I'm saying? They point back to that prophecy. But the Jews weren't running around looking for a pregnant Jewess. They weren't, looking, they weren't running around looking for a virgin girl in the Jewish uh, community who was pregnant. No, that prophecy was better understood and better grasped after the fact. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? There are many prophecies which, especially in the book of Revelation, I'm convinced the church, I love these people who call themselves experts in prophecy. I grew up in the Pentecostal church, and we used to have these preachers come through, you know, every once in a while, and oh, he's a, he's a prophecy expert. Why, he can explain every prophecy there is in the Bible. Boy, he's an expert on prophecy. Yeah, my nose hairs. <laughs> Half the prophecies in Scripture, I guarantee you, you won't get till after they come to pass. Then all of a sudden you look and say, aha, this is what the Lord was talking about. One of the things the Holy Ghost over the years has spoken to me and kind of an aha moment is look at the nuisance the church in America has become. Look at how much of a thorn in the flesh the church of America has become. Look how hated the church in America has become. Thanks primarily to the fundamentalist nutcases and fruitcakes <laughs> who run around preaching their malice, their hatred. Oh no, they claim the gospel is rooted in love. Why, if you go down right now, if you go down Gross Road in Mesquite, you'll see the Baptist church there. God is love. God loves you. But don't walk in that church and say, Hi, this is my partner and I. We'd like to come to your church because I got news for you. God's going to turn from love to hate in about three seconds. Yep. Am I telling the truth? Yep. Oh yeah, God's love, all right. Problem is, people who claim to represent God aren't. That's and right. And they should be. Amen. Well, I got news for you, folks. What the Holy Ghost spoke to me, and what the Holy Ghost showed me some years back is, oh, there's going to be persecution coming, and I got news for you, it's sooner than later for the American church. Mm -hmm. But it is going to be well-earned, and well deserved. We make the assumption that that persecution will come because the church has done everything right. Because the people of God have lived holy and godly lives. Because they're picketing the abortion clinics and they're picketing the gay pride parades was what they ought to have done. Wrong. Wrong.
I cannot speak for the church worldwide. There are genuine Christians being genuinely persecuted today in other parts of the world, and it doesn't have a thing in the world to do with them picketing. It doesn't have a thing in the world to do with them uh, so-called standing up for righteousness. No, they have to worship and gather in secret. Mm -hmm. They can't even let their meeting place be known because they risk... In the Arab world, for instance, they risk losing their heads, literally. If it be known, they've converted to Christianity. All these people aren't making a public nuisance of themselves. They're embracing their faith, and by God, they're embracing it quietly. They're keeping their faith rather close to the vest. Am I telling the truth today? Yeah. And yet, if it becomes known, if someone asks them, do you today profess to be a follower of Christ? Do you profess today that Jesus Christ is God? They can lose their lives. Because unless they deny the Lord, they have to answer truthfully, and they will, and many of them do. And they wind up losing their lives for it. So there is persecution going on around the world right now. And it is not persecution that is well deserved. It is not persecution that has been earned. But I'm not talking today about persecution in Russia. I'm not talking today about persecution of Christians in China. I'm not talking today about persecution of Christians in Islamic countries. I'm talking today about America and the American church. The American church has lived a life of fatness. Like the church in Laodicea, the word of God says, the Lord looked at the church in Laodicea and said, Thou art rich and increased with goods. Or excuse me, that the church in Laodicea said, We are rich and increased with goods, and we have need of nothing. <laughs> That's the church in America today. Oh, they've become as selfish and as prideful as their secular counterpart. Mm -hmm. You can barely tell the difference today between a Christian in American society and a non-Christian when it comes to issues like paying taxes. <laughs> let me repeat, let me rephrase that. <laughs> paying fair share of your taxes. Mm -hmm. Taking care of the poor and the needy. Helping people with health care, helping people with education, being kind and merciful and generous to those who come to our country who are not born on our shores. You can't even tell the difference between the sinner and the saint when it comes to these issues because they all have the same selfish, self-centered attitudes on these issues. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. What a pitiful state of affairs. But I'm here to tell you today, folks, persecution is coming to the church in America. And I hate to say it, but we're going to get caught up in it because whether we like it or not, we may not act like our big sister, but we're still part of the same family. We may get caught up in it some because unfortunately, the bigger brothers and the bigger sisters are acting the fool, and we're just the youngest, and we can't help how they've gone before us and the path that they have traveled before us and the reputation they have created for us. How many people a day won't come into our church? How many people a day won't step foot in our church? Because they are livid, they are mad, they're angry at the way so-called Christians conduct themselves. They don't even look at our doctrine. They don't even look at what we teach. They don't even investigate what is going on from behind this pulpit. They're not interested. You cannot generate interest in them because they know what they think they know. And what they know is not what they ought to know. Amen. I got news for you folks. Not every American today believes the way old Mr. Trump believes. That's Not right. every American today holds the values Mr. Trump holds. Not every uh, American today has the same morality Donald Trump had. Thank God Praise Almighty God. or God would rain down fire from heaven. And like Sodom and Gomorrah, 
America would be destroyed because if there's a sodomite in the land, it's the man in the White House. Yep. He's far more a sodomite than I'll ever be, trust me, according to the Word of God. Read your Bible. It's about fullness of bread. It's about pride. Mm -hmm. It's about idleness. <laughs> oh my goodness. It's about not caring for the poor, uh, yeah. not caring for the stranger. Uh -huh. That is what the Word of God said the sins of Sodom were. Mm -hmm. That's right. Oh my goodness. So, honey, if you're looking for a sodomite, all you got to do is look at Washington, D.C. Go to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. The biggest sodomite ever lived in America is taking up residence there right now. God granted Jesus for a very short amount of time. Mm -hmm. I'm not joking. We've got persecution coming, and we may very well get swept up in it at some degree because the church in America has earned it. The church in America has made such a godless nuisance of itself. It has ignored every commandment of the Lord. It has ignored the most important commandments of God. One of the primary, the holiness church loves to quote, Follow peace with all men from the book of Hebrews. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see God. That doesn't mean you'll possess holiness. Mm -hmm. You go to a greyhound track, oh, now Sister High here, holiness, her, her hair's starting to fall out and her teeth are loosening because the preacher had the gall to refer to one of those dens of iniquity, a dog racing track where people, uh, listen, lady, i got a point to make, okay? <laughs> get the point and get over it. You go to a dog track, Lisa, and those greyhounds are in the, you know, that lineup at the front, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they open those cages up. When do they open the cages up? <coughs> After they release a rabbit on a rail. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. And that rabbit starts to go, and when they open them cages up, them dogs come tearing out of those cages. Mm -hmm. They come tearing out of behind those gates, and they're chasing after that rabbit. And they're going to run that race chasing that rabbit. And you know what? Not a one of those dogs ever going to catch that rabbit. That's right. You ain't never seen a greyhound race where the dogs caught up with the rabbit. It's never happened and it never will happen. That's not the objective. The objective is simply to see which dog is fastest, not to see which dog can catch the rabbit. When God says to his people, follow peace. With all men, you know what, try as you might, you may never be able to be at peace with everybody. There may be somebody out there that's going to be mad at you and stay mad at you. It don't matter how much you try to soothe it over. It doesn't matter how much you try to make peace with them. It doesn't matter how much you try. But Martin, there's some people just, you know, they're just nasty and negative and they're just going to be like that, Bill, regardless of what you do or what you say. You can do everything in the world to try to make up with them for maybe having wronged them or done them uh, uh, dirty or, you know, something you've done in your life that affected them in a negative way. You may do everything in your power, and guess what? It ain't going to work because they're going to be mad at you. They made up their mind. They're going to stay mad at you. Well, the Bible said follow peace with all men. It doesn't say you're ever going to catch the bunny. It just says chase the bunny. Hello now. <laughs> but it also says... Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see God. I've got news for you, folk. You're following peace and holiness. You're never going to lay hands on either one of them, but you should be in pursuit of them. Hello now. You should be in pursuit of them. Every day of your Christian life, you should desire in your heart to be more and more like Jesus. You should desire in your heart to better reflect the love and the grace and the mercy of God. Am I telling the truth? We ought to be in pursuit of holiness. We ought to be in pursuit of peace with all men. Doesn't mean you're ever going to catch the bunny. Mm -hmm. Until you get raptured. 
Mm-hmm. Till you make it to glory, then guess what? Then you Amen. get the prize. Hallelujah. Amen. But until then, you're just chasing the bunny. Because there are things that are going to prevent you from ever catching that bunny so long as you're in the race. And I got news for you. This stuff right here, of course, I got more of it than a lot of people. But it's called the flesh. <laughs> See, that flesh will prevent you from ever laying hold of holiness. That flesh will prevent you from ever being perfect. Amen. That flesh will ever, it'll prevent you from ever being holy. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? But you can be godly. That means you can do things like God does things. You mm-hmm. can pursue things that please God. That you can do, even in the flesh, you can do that. But we're supposed to be in pursuit of holiness. We're supposed to be in pursuit of The desire to reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be in pursuit of peace with all men. If you think picketing abortion clinics and gay pride parades is following peace with all men, let me put it to you about as simple as this preacher knows how to put it to you. You're an idiot. (laughs) You're an idiot. You're unnecessarily making an enemy of people that you claim are lost. You're making an enemy of people that you claim need God. You're making an enemy of people that you ought to be reaching out to with the love of God, that you ought to be demonstrating the love and the compassion of God to. And instead, you are condemning, criticizing. How would you like it if God had people out there doing that for you when you were still in need of salvation? How would you have liked it if When you got your divorce, like Tammy Faye, her mom finally divorced her dad, who was an old drunk and a carouser, and he'd leave for weeks on end and leave Tammy, and she had a number of brothers and sisters, and her mother leave them all alone while he was out messing with some woman for weeks on end, Martin. Then he'd come home to his wife. Can you imagine? And God help her, she actually decided finally she'd had enough and she was going to divorce the man and she divorced the man because he was a carouser. Now the Bible said there's only one grounds for divorce and that is adultery. If you divorce on any other grounds except adultery and it has to be a legitimate ground. You you can't just say it was adultery because you want to legitimize your divorce. But it has to be based only on adultery. That's the only grounds God gives for exiting a marriage. How do you like that? Well, she had biblical grounds. She divorced the man. She said, Tammy Faye said, one day I was standing at the top of the stairs and some of the high-haired holiness Pentecostal women from the local assembly said, God, church came over to talk to her mother. She said, and there I stood at the top of the stairs listening as they berated and belittled my mother and let her know that if she had been a godly woman, and if she had lived a holy life, and if she had done things the way God wanted her to do things, that her husband would have been saved, and he'd have been full of the Holy Ghost, and he'd have been in church. So the divorce was entirely on her. It was all her fault. Got news for you. Two out of... Excuse me, one out of two marriages in America ends in divorce these days, and that number is no different in the church than it is in the world. Mm -hmm. I wonder if these, I get some mad, (laughs) I I just, I hate using names, but sometimes that's just, you know, the way I want to hit them. (laughs) (sighs) And these people, Martin, who have been divorced, These people who are remarried. These people who just 30, 40 years ago would have been asked to leave many churches. Mm -hmm. That's right. Because of their divorce and remarriage. These people, I wonder how they'd have felt if, as they tried to walk into the church, there were people outside carrying signs that say, Adulterer! Adulteress! Divorcees are going to hell! Fornicators! Because I got news for you, according to the Word of God in the New Testament, when you read the word fornication, guess what is included in a literal translation of the word fornication in the New Testament? Having sex with a divorced person. 
Oh my goodness, Brother Charles, are you trying to tell me that, that according to New Testament teaching, having intercourse with a person who is divorced is considered fornication? Yes, it is. Oh, but Brother Graham didn't tell you that, does he? <laughs> oh, Brother, brother uh, uh, Copeland doesn't tell you that, does he? Oh, no, they're too busy preaching against queers because like their Messiah, Mr. Trump, they love to have you looking over here so you don't see what really is going on over here. It's called distraction. And the church has been distracted. But they, the preachers are false prophets and liars. I'm going to say it plain today. They are false prophets and liars. And they're so busy making people look at the homosexuals. They're so busy making people look at those women getting abortions. Because they are not about to talk about the real issues that the word of God addresses. They're not about to kill their Lisa. No, they wouldn't get half the money coming to Maple that they have. <laughs> oh, no, no. They wouldn't have half the people in their churches that they've got right. if they really talked about mm -hmm. what the Bible really says on any number of issues. Now, the church in America has made a nuisance of itself. Let me tell you something. When they say, I believe... Donald Trump, that, that God ordained Donald Trump oh. to be president... Well, I got news for you. I have to agree with you. Absolutely, I do. I can't argue with it. The Bible said God sets mm -hmm. up kings and princes. He's the one yeah. that does it. That's what Scripture said. I can't argue with that. Mm -hmm. The only thing is, I think your thought as to what the reasons are and God's thoughts as to what the reasons are are very different. Because... Your support, evangelical, your support, fundamentalist, of this wicked and godless, demonic man, all for the sake of getting a few morsels thrown your way, politically, that are going to satisfy you and make you happy. Your support of that man has revealed your hypocrisy. It has demonstrated just how godless, and how wicked and how evil you really are. You can't hide behind your little mask anymore. You can't hide behind this false holiness and this pretense of righteousness. You can't hide behind your pharisaical robes any longer because, honey, you've been stripped naked. And everything you really are is lying bare before the world. And if you think the unbeliever in our society today doesn't see the evangelical and fundamentalist church for exactly what it is, oh, you couldn't be more wrong. And I've got news for you. Got news for you. Many in the evangelical and fundamentalist churches are seeing it also. Many people are leaving those churches today because they see the blatant hypocrisy. They see the rampant lying that is going on to cover somebody who is doing everything that is contrary to God. Yep. Folks, I'm here to tell you today, this rise today in anti-theism, this hatred for the church, this hatred, this anger at God that is on the rise today, it is much anticipated by those of us who understand Scripture, those of us who have any knowledge of prophecy. I understand today, Lisa, that it's necessary because at some point the Antichrist is going to stir up armies and gather armies to go to war against God. Well, somebody got to fight in that war. God's got his armies. It's going to be those of us who endure to the end. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, the only way, the only way to beat this old anti-theism spirit in the world today is to be faithful to our God. Hallelujah. The only way is to hold your ground and stand still and see the salvation of the Lord with you. Because i got news for you. The fight is not with you. No. The fight is through you if you let the enemy use you. Hello now, but the war is against God. When I'm trying to finish up today, I've, I've lost, I've misplaced my watch in wedding ring. 
I take them off, and I cannot sleep with anything on my body, you know. Uh, I don't know what it is. I can't stand rings on or watches or anything when I'm trying to sleep. I take them off. I put my wedding ring on my watch, and I lay it on the side of the bed. I must have knocked it over or something. And Ginger loves, the minute I knock something over, she runs straight for it. <laughs> and then it's missing for weeks on end. We eventually find it under a bed or in a closet or somewhere. Well, I got a feeling I must have knocked it over in my sleep. She beelined and got it, and now I can't find it anywhere. So I don't have my watch, so if I'm going along, blame it on that. <laughs> I'm here to tell you today, children, persecution's coming. But it, in America, anyway, it's well-deserved. It's been earned. The church has brought it upon itself because it has not acted right. It has not done right. What must we do then? I'll tell you what we must do. We must be right. We must live right. We must do right. Because if we don't, then one of the, the primary, most important Aspects of the prophecy concerning the Lord Jesus Christ uh, return will not be fulfilled, and it has to be fulfilled before the Lord can come. The Lord said, this gospel must first be preached all over the world in every nation. Well, that means somebody has to be faithful. That means somebody has to be doing it right. Am I telling the truth? That means somebody has to have it set in their mind that we're going to be faithful to this message and we're going to be faithful to this doctrine no matter what anybody else does. No matter what anybody else says. If you remember, that's what I was beginning to say a moment ago. If you remember when... The man who was to become the Apostle Paul, he was known then as Saul. Saul was persecuting the church in the first century. He was going about and doing exactly what Jesus said they would do in the last days. He was delivering men and women who confessed and professed Christ to the synagogues mm -hmm. and to the leaders. You'll notice as well in, in what the Lord said. I've got to throw this in here in Mark chapter 13. You'll notice the Lord said they'll deliver you up in the synagogues. He said they'll also deliver you up before kings. What does that tell you? It tells you there's a mingling of religion with government. Mm, interesting. There shouldn't be, but there is. Listen, Paul, who was then known as Saul, is persecuting the church. And finally, one day on the road to Damascus, after Stephen has been stoned, and Saul stood there and served as the coat bearer for those who wanted to fling rocks at Stephen. He witnessed the death of one of God's earliest martyrs. And one day on the road to Damascus, Saul had a light shine down from heaven upon him, and the word of God said he heard a voice. As did all those who were with him. They all heard the voice. But only Saul saw the one who was in the light. And he knew it was God. But he suddenly realized. I don't think I know God as well as I thought I knew God. Who art thou Lord? And the voice answered back and said. I am Jesus. Is it hard for thee to kick against the pricks? said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? See, when persecution comes against the church, the object of that persecution is not the church. It is the God of the church. You come against God's people, you're coming against God. But I got news for you. That's only God's real people. That's only God's true people. You come against people who call themselves Christians, but they're not being Christian. They're on their own. Hallelujah. I got news for you, folks. I'm glad for that, because the day is coming, brother, when all these fundies and all these evangelicals who've been claiming they're, they're the apple of God's eye, they're going to start experiencing persecution, and they're going to say, God, where are you? And God's going to say, sorry, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. You and I weren't in relationship. If we were in relationship, you'd look a lot more like me. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Oh, but the church, the people of God, who are really living this thing the way it's supposed to be lived, 
when that same persecution comes and we say, Lord, we need your help, guess what's going to happen? He's going to send angels like he did for Peter to release the prison door. Hallelujah. And let Peter out of jail. He's going to uh, shake the prison doors open and break the shackles from the feet of those just like he did with Paul and Silas. God's going to move in powerful ways, folks, for the true church. But those who've been playing games those who've been professing without possessing are going to find quickly that while they experience the hatred and the animosity and the malice that is aimed at God, when it comes to fighting back, oh, no, no, no. You've been fighting this culture war. You've been fighting this battle all along, honey. Keep fighting. Have a good time. You've been using carnal weapons, you've been using carnal ideas, you've been using carnal ideologies, you just keep on using them because I don't work with people who don't live and look like me. I don't do for people who aren't following my instructions, who aren't doing things the way I say, hello, now am I telling the truth today? Say, Pastor, where is the good news in today's message? The good news is we're doing everything in our power to do this thing right. Hallelujah. And for that reason, I believe when this time of persecution comes, we're going to be able to count on him. Hallelujah. Because he knows he can count on us. Amen. Hallelujah. The much anticipated rise of anti-theism is upon us. The Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. The armies that will one day fight against God are even now gathering and they're first going to set their sights on the physical representatives of God, both those who do right and those who do not. God's going to work with one of those. <laughs> You tell me which one you think he's going to work with. So I'm not afraid of this rise. I'm not afraid of this wave of anti-theism. Because, honey, you don't have to acknowledge God. You don't even have to like God for God to be God. Hallelujah. Amen. You don't have to like God. You can hate him all you want to. You can be as mad at him as you want to. You can have all the malice of thought you want to toward God. I've got news for you. When I need him, he's still there for me. Mm -hmm. Because God honors those who live right. God honors those who do right. God honors those who believe right. Am I telling the truth today? Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon?